Okay, so um, my name's Clive Neal. I work at NOC and I'm a satellite oceanographer. Um, I'm going to start off with three things that are not included in this talk, and that's an explanation of the benefits of seagrass within a RISO project. I'll leave that for others and it's elsewhere. There's a lovely poster one of my other colleagues has explained, and that shows the fisheries aspect. It's also not going to go into any detail of my methodology. Anyone else welcome to call me later if they're interested. And it also does not have any words or numbers on the slides. I would like to quickly thank some people who have data sets I've used uh, to validate and train my model. That's been Swansea University, University of Plymouth, National England, and actually Project Seagrass as well. Okay, so I thought I'd flash up an image of the Scilly Islands, which is one of our case study areas. Uh, the reason it's a slightly sh uh, strange shape is that I have uh, masked it to 20 meters of water. You're not going to find seagrass in the UK waters to 20 meters, but it, may, it takes quite a lot of processing power on the computer. So if I simply snip out pixels well outside the zone, uh, it runs a lot faster. Um, this particular image, actually I'll get that in a minute. Um, the satellite I'm using is called Sentinel-2. It's European Space Agency satellite. It produces optical images, optical being the red, green, blue channels that we're familiar with, which might we, we see on our Google base maps. Um, sorry, I'm not on the mic. And, uh, but it also has near-infrared data. Uh, so it has quite a wide range of bands, not just the optical bands, although it's known as an optical satellite. Um, it's about 500 miles up there. It whizzes round, it goes, I believe it does 14 orbits a day, so maybe every couple of hours, it's kind of like shooting round up there. Um, it has a 10 meter footprint. So this room that we're sitting in today, for me, would represent maybe two pixels. So that's the kind of spatial scale of my data. As a six day repeat rate, which is quite rich, there's quite a lot of data, but it is a limiting factor in a country with plenty of cloud cover, because optical data does not operate through cloud. Um, there's some quite severe limitations of this method, in addition to the pixel size and the number of images I get back each year. You've got the cloud issue, always have with optical data. There's sediment in the water column, which is why I'm actually choosing uh, the Isles of Scilly, because there's less sediment in the water column. I think you can see it's really quite clear waters, so we've got a good chance of it working. Um, there's a need for training data, so remote sensing data, one, if I'm using uh, which random forests, I need some training pixels of known locations of seagrass, and often that can be difficult. So the higher quality your training data is, the better the outputs will be. Um, and we've got some great data inside that box on the upper right. Um, what else was I going to say? Um, oh, yes, yeah, so there's, there's some other effects such as sun glint on the sea, tides make an effect, the difference in the water column. There can be algae blooms and could be any number of things that throw off the method. Um, I'm going to zoom in on the area of interest. The reason, as I pointed out, that's a good area of interest is because we've got a lot of supporting data. We've got some in situ data, which is repeating diving and snorkeling over quadrants over a number of years. We've also had glass bottom boat surveys. There's been some other remote sensing data sources using UAV flights, of which we've got a pilot here. And there's, a, there's another pilot as two, two in the audience. There's been some high resolution photography, which has been expertly labeled. So I have confidence where I do know seagrass exists. In fact, that bed is a very known location as seagrass. Um, then I am going to, the, the seagrass, some of it is tidal, it wets and dries, and some of it is, is um, com subtidal, completely submerged all the time. That makes a big difference because certain wavelengths penetrate the water column and certain wavelengths don't. For example, near infrared, it does not penetrate water. But what it does do is it's highly reflective of healthy vegetation. So if I have seagrass outside the water, and this particular image was taken at low tide, I can swap out the red channel for near infrared, and any of those little zones which are highlighted in red are where the near infrared is scattering back, being highly reflected off 
uh, of, of seagrass, so I can use those areas to train up a random forest classifier to extend it to other pixels outside my known locations. For example, one of the Wintra survey sites, which showed up very clearly, this uh, tidal seagrass was around there. And that's what I used to train up the first classifier. So I'm actually training two classifiers, one for the submerged seagrass and one for the tidal seagrass. We'll start with the easy one, the tidal seagrass. Um, that, uh, that's my results. So the dark brown squares, mostly they fringe the islands. There's some sections in deeper water where there's rocky bits that stick out. Um, it does a very good job. Then we move on to the submerged stuff. And I just want you to look at one particular area. Which I know is seagrass. There's some water bottom, clear water bottom, which will be sand, as well as some more patchy bits of seagrass. However, there's a problem with the method. It overclassifies. So bang, that's what I get back out. Some of that is seagrass, some of it isn't, some of it may be macroalgae. How do I get rid of that problem? I took data from five years and I trained up five classifiers, did the same thing 2019 to 2023. And if for a particular pixel, um, if for a particular pixel, um, it classified as seagrass four out of the five years or five out of five years, uh, there's a fairly good chance it was seagrass. It gets rid of a lot of the overclassification. So that is my final map showing the tidal and the subtidal seagrass. Just finally, I'm going to quickly, that's what it looks like. The whole of the islands is silly. In the yellow circle, I'm just going to show a couple of the high res photographs. Um, so one can see the bed of seagrass, which is well mapped with the glass water bottom and various other surveys. And I'm going to zoom in even further. Um, where, what have we got? That's 100 meters. I would just like to point out that the satellite sat up there 500 me miles up. Is looking down with its sensor and a lot of even in between the seagrass is patches of sand. So that takes away from the, the reflectance values which I'm using to train the classifier. So it's, it's another of the limitations of the method. Obviously the denser the beds, the better. But I think I did a really good job, I believe. I'm gonna move on to some other case studies and these layers are going to be handed over to Kiara who's going to put them into her habitat suitability model. And we're also going to put them into the seeds tool, which is the ultimate product of the RISO project. Thanks, Clive. Um, so I am, my name is Dr. Chiara Vitelli, and I work as a postdoc on the RISO project, mainly looking at habitat suitability modeling of seagrass. Um, we're using this to identify and inform the project of the most optimal places where restoration will take place. Um, so if you're not familiar with habitat suitability modeling, it relates uh, biodiversity or species to prevailing um, environmental conditions. So you're looking at observations of the locations of species, um, looking at the environmental factors, getting that data, and then trying to predict where it's likely to occur. So some of the outputs we've had so far on the RISO project, we've done a literature review um, and looked at uh, macroalgae, um, habitat suitability modeling and species distribution modeling um, to work out sort of the best methods to use for this uh, habitat suitability modeling project. Um, we've also done a study around whales for some local sites. Um, and uh, those are already published, so you can look at those in your own time and I'll pass on any details if you have them. I'm aware of it over time. Um, so this is some of the results using some of Clive's data, but also data that we had previously. So just using the first map is just open source data that we used um, from EMODnet and Coper Copernicus. Um, and as you can see, the green is showing um, the suitability of seagrass, where we expect to find it. And you can see it's green in like quite a lot of the areas around the Isles of Scilly. So again, this is an Isles of Scilly um, case study. Um, map B shows with using hydrodynamic um, data that we collected from, that was provided to us from uh, Plymouth University and um, looking at things like uh, power from currents and shear stress to add 
Okay, so we've got to move on. Okay, I'll leave it there then. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks very much.